Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Tatwa Chintan Q4 FY22 earnings conference call hosted by Investec Capital Services. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anshuman Gupta from Investec Capital Services. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, moderator, and good evening to everyone. On behalf of Investec Capital, I welcome you all for Tattva Chimtan Pharma Ken's Q4 and full year FI22 earnings call. Today, we have senior management team from Tattva, represented by Mr. Chimtan Shah, Managing Director, and Mr. Ashok Bhotra, CFO. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Dinesh from Tattva Chimtan. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Anshman. Good afternoon, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you all to our Q4 Financial Year 22 earning call. Please note that a copy of our disclosures is available on the investor section on our website as well as on the stock exchanges. Please do note that anything said on this call which reflects our outlook towards the future or which could be construed as a forward-looking statement must be reviewed in conjunction with the risk that company faces in terms of uncertainty. With that, I would like to hand over the floor to our MD, Mr. Chintan Shah, for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Good evening to everyone who are present on our fourth quarter and year ending evening call. A warm welcome and thank you for joining us. I trust everyone is doing well. With our year end results, coincidentally, Papua Dintan is also celebrating its birthday today. 25th April 1996 was the day of inauguration of Tatwa Chintan's first plant at Ankleshwar. Today we have completed 26 years. I am taking this opportunity to thank the team of Tatwa Chintan who have contributed to its success and to also, also to all its stakeholders. For Tatwa Chintan, FY21-22 has ended with lots of good memories and proud achievements. First time, we crossed the revenue mark of 400 crores. Again, for the first time, we crossed a profit before tax of more than 100 crores. Also, our exports revenue crossed the mark of rupees 300 crores for the first time. And in fact, our export revenue of FY22 has exceeded the total revenue of FY21. Last and most uh, memorable was successfully getting listed on Indian stock exchanges. So a big congratulations to all for making this as one of the most memorable year in Tatwa Chintan's history. As you are aware, we are an integrated niche specialty chemical company working in four product categories. We are leading manufacturers of phase transfer catalysts with capabilities to offer the largest basket of PTC products. These products are used as catalysts in manufacturing of pharma APIs, flavor fragrances, agrochemicals, etc. PTC comprised 23% of revenues during FY22. We have seen a revenue growth of nearly 20% year on year basis. We continue to maintain our leadership position in this area. During the past year, we got commercial approval from two well-known MMC customers in pharma and agrospace age, who will start commercial usage from current year. We expect the revenues for PTC segment to grow at a historical pace. Under our second category, we manufacture structure directing agents, SDAs, which are key building blocks for manufacturing high precision GOI which finds application in automotive emission control, petrochemicals, continuous flow chemistries, etc. We have seen a very strong growth of 87% year on year in this segment. Large part of our SBA demand currently is coming from auto emission control application. I have explained earlier that the ongoing shortage of semiconductor chips availability is leading to a subdued demand of SDAs. This is reflected in mutated revenue growth uh, of this seg segment during quarter 4 FY22. The ongoing political crisis has further impacted the semiconductor availability 
leading into still further postponement of demands of SDAs into auto emission control area. We expect Q1 and Q2 of FY23 will see a weaker demand in SDAs, though the underlying demand of SDAs continues to remain very strong. We expect strong demand revival upon improvement of semiconductor chip availability. Despite subdued demands for the next two quarters, we expect to maintain the business with minor impacts in this segment. Despite of the short-term challenges, we are very confident of strong FDA demand growth over next few years, and FDA would continue to be our growth driver for a few years. Now, talking on the brighter aspects of FDA business, during the past year, we have got formal approval from two large customers. Commercial business with one of these customers has, uh, has been negotiated, and supply is to begin from Q2. Commercial business with the second customer is under discussion and expected to begin supply from January of 23. Also, we are undergoing approval process with yet another important customer for which we expect to finish the plant trials within 2022. Under our third category, we manufacture electrolyte salts which are used in supercapacitor batteries which find application in automobile, electronics, and for energy storage devices. During FY22, this product category comprised 1.3% of our total revenue, and in absolute numbers, revenue grew by more than 87% year-on-year basis. During current year, we got formal approval from a new customer for energy storage device application. And we have been already awarded commercial supply opportunity for 2022. We are also into pilot scale approval with one new customer, and we have been given opportunity to begin initial approval process with yet another customer. Both new opportunities are coming from the new products developed at Satwach Indan in this application area during the last financial year. We are seeing a steady rise in applications getting into commercializations using supercapacitor batteries and energy storage devices. The application of supercaps in EV and automobile application is gaining traction. Also, the application of energy storage devices in renewable energy storage systems is getting into commercialization. We expect multi multifold growth in this segment and the strong application growth is expected over the coming years. Under the fourth category, PASC, we manufacture pharma and agro-intermediates and specialty chemicals products. Under this segment, we have seen a year-on-year -year growth of 12% and revenues have crossed with 100 crores, contributing 23.6% to the revenue. Under this segment, one of the products has got into full-scale commercialization and should start getting a good volume growth. One more product, which was under approval since 2020 has now been fully approved by the customer and we are beginning actual commercial supply from Q2. We shall see a ramp up of demand in this product over next two years. Both these above products involve PTC technologies in production. One more product which I already talked about earlier, we have completed development work and should be submitting our samples within a few weeks. This product involves our zeolite catalyst-based continuous flow chemistry application to achieve superior quality. We are simultaneously working on pilot setup of this product as well. Commercial supply should take about 18 months time to materialize. We informed earlier about monoblime. Monoblime continuous flow development work is completed. Equipment designing is completed for pilot scale. And now we are finalizing the vendor for equipment supply. Plant scale commercialization by this new technique would happen in next financial year. Besides these ongoing efforts, we have developed and submitted our plant scale sample for a new product in the area of metal extractions. We expect the commercial supply to start towards Q4. We are progressing steadily with our development of continuous flow application in two products. We have progressed very well with development of a solvent into EV battery application area using continuous flow chemistry. 
we have been recently granted opportunities to develop two more products in agro space which involves continuous plasmas we expect a strong growth in the tsc product category over the next year and we are also focusing strongly in development of various products under this category using specialized technologies to ensure continuity of growth i am pleased to share that our development team has is successfully running pilot scale trials of a product in flame retardant category we would undertake the full scale plant trials from june post installation of the necessary infrastructure at the head acid plant we are beginning with one product and gradually intend to develop a portfolio of multiple products under this category this is a large product segment wherein we are focusing on high purity and niche application area customers we shall begin approval of our product with customers from june we intend to henceforth report this as a separate product category using our electrolysis technology we are seeing a good progress towards achieving ultra high purity levels of products having application into semiconductors and electronic space we have been offered an opportunity by a large mnc customer to take us into approval process with these high purity substances this is an extremely high entry barrier area with the current level of progress in development we are very confident of meeting with the stringent quality requirements in this product commercialization can take about 18 to 24 months after the initial sample approval one successful we would be the only indian company in this segment and also among the select few companies globally towards our effort of optimizing green chemistry concept we have taken a task to use usage of solvents at the plant in one of our large products we are ending up with a mix of solvents which are difficult to separate hence we are unable to reuse the solvent our development team has come up with a unique and brilliant solution enabling us to reuse the solvent we have recently implemented this technique commercially in our dahej acid plant this will enable us to reuse the solvent to the tune of few hundred metric tons per annum also in similar direction yet in another product we are successful on lab scale to eliminate to completely eliminate the use of solvent and instead make an equally pure product in water solution form directly we are currently discussing with the customer to take up the product for re qualification due to a major process change if the customer approves the change we will be able to further reduce solvent consumption by several hundred metric tons i am immensely pleased to inform you that on together for sustainability platform we have drastically improved our audit score year on year basis from 54% to 78% last year and this year we have achieved 87% this is a matter of pride for petro chintan and it also demonstrates our genuine efforts in moving towards sustainable solutions during the fourth quarter india was facing the third wave which spread profusely but was not as damaging as the previous covid waves its effect on our business has not been much however the spread of omicron variant and subsequent lockdowns in china and winter olympics had an impact on shipping logistics and availability of certain raw materials fortunately we had anticipated this challenge well in time thereby stock in of raw materials during the end of q3 which helped us to manage our production in a smooth fashion and adhere to customer demands on timely basis <clears throat> considering the escalated raw material prices even in the fourth quarter we are thankful to our key customers who have mostly absorbed the increasing cost of freight and raw materials in certain cases which has ensured that we could operate with decent margins during the quarter the freight cost rose from 3.7% to 7.6% of revenue year on year basis fuel cost increased from 3% to 6.2% of revenue year on year basis and packaging cost increased from 1.7 to 3.1% of revenue year on year basis despite of this challenge we were able to achieve 
an EBITDA of 23% in Q4 and 27% in the whole of FY22. I would like to highlight here that the impact in demand in one product category is offset by subsequent demand in another product category. As our products find application in varied end industries across geographies, we continue to see good synergies between our products as we are seeing our clients consuming our products by the strength of all the good innovations and the great support we have delivered to them over the years. Also, please note that SBA is the largest contributor of our EBITDA margins, followed by PAC and electrolyte salts, and eventually followed by frame retardants and PTCs. So, wedding demand in each product category will have its impact on the margins for the particular product. For the upcoming year, with new customers' additions and new products getting into commercialization, new product category of flame retardants being introduced. We will continue to grow at a good rate. Despite the change in product mix that we envisage for next year, we shall be able to maintain our EBITDA margins within our historic range for the full year. Our approach of being an integrated manufacturer, producing niche specialty chemicals, having leadership position across product categories, diversified geographically with 79% exports as on FY22, focus on green chemistry by using cutting edge technology, in-house R&D facility with 24 employees including 10 senior level qualified scientists, has helped us steadily grow our presence and more importantly, help grow the customer's confidence in the future. Despite the turbulent macroeconomic situation of COVID lockdowns and geopolitical tensions globally, ongoing capacity expansion of setting up additional facilities at our Zahed SEZ and expanding our R&D capabilities at Vadodara from the IPO process is running as per schedule and we target to commission the facility by December of 2022. The continues with total workforce strength of 471. During the fiscal, we added 35 permanent employees, which includes appointment of CTO, Chief Technical Officer. I want to take a moment and recognize and thank our employees for their unwavering commitment and hard work all through the year. With this, I conclude my remarks, and now I would like to hand over the call to our CFO. Mr. Ashok Botra to take us through the financial performance. Ashok. Thank you, sir, and good evening, everyone. I begin by summarizing financial highlights for the year gone by. During the full year, FY22, revenue from operations was at 4,336 4, million versus 3,004 million in FY21. That is growth of 44% on YOY basis, backed by increased capacity utilization and demand. EBITDA was at uh, 1,171 million versus 716 million in FY21. That is growth of 64% on YOY basis. Net profit was 959 million versus 523 million in FY21. That is growth of 83% on YOY basis. EBITDA margin was at 27% in FY22 versus 24% in FY21 on account of better product mix with increased sale of SDA, which is a high margin equity product category. Fact margin was at 22% in FY22 versus 17% in FY21. For the full year, PTC considered 23% of the revenue, SDA was at 52%, lactolite side was at 1.3% and PSC 24%. During the year, export stood at 3,405 million, surpassing the entire year revenue of FY21. Exports were made to 25, more than 25 countries, contributing around 80% of the revenue. For this part, during Q4, FY22, revenue from operations stood at 985 million. As already explained by Kintan sir in his comment, we saw a 9% decline in revenue Q on Q basis due to subdued demand of SDA during the quarter on account of semiconductor chip shortage. EBITDA was at 220. 3 million and mar EBITDA margin was at 23 percent during the quarter. Trade in, uh, prices increased by 2.3 percent as a percentage of sale and packing expenses increased by 0.8 percent. 
resulting in lower EBITDA margin. Pet was at 175 million and pet margin is at 18 percent. During the fourth quarter, PTC constituted 31 percent of the revenue, SDA 40 percent, electoral exert 2.3 percent, rest coming from PASC. During the quarter, our export constituted around 74 percent of the revenue. Out of our net IPO proceed of 2072.81 million, 640.97 million have been utilized and on, as on 31st March 22. Our balance sheet remains strong with cash and cash equivalent, including bank balance and FD. For FY22 was at 1,770 million. The installed reactive capacity was at 294 KL and installed SME line at 27% with a capacity utilization of 90% and 64% respectively during FY22. That concludes my update on financial and now we open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. The first question is from Sanjay Jain from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Chintan Bhai, for taking my question. A um, few Sorry. questions from my side. Uh, first on the SDA, now we said that Q4 was weak, even Q3 was weak. Now we are talking of Q1 being Q2 and Q1 and Q2 being weak, weak for us. Uh, how does the full year look like? Uh, can we do uh, the SDA revenue in FY23 equivalent to FY22, or uh, we still believe that uh, for FY23 there will be a good growth over FY22 in SDA revenue? Uh, that's the first question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Basically, yes. Yeah, so basically, what has happened is that demand, underlying demand, still continues to remain strong. But everyone, because of these geopolitical issues that have recently erupted, that has caused an issue of a specific raw material required for a semiconductor. This is leading to a further decrease in availability of semiconductors for the time. So the orders are getting postponed. Demand continues to remain very robust, but only the uptake of demand is not happening. So as soon as the semiconductor availability smoothens out, which we expect to happen by August or September of this year. And we expect this demand to again come back. So this is going to be kind of a pent up demand that should come back because currently people are trying to consume their inventory pipeline and not trying to order more material as of now. With all this, we expect though Q1 is going to be really uh, low. Q2, we will see an improvement happening from those levels. And Q3, Q4, we should see a very strong demand coming back. So we expect more or less to maintain the revenues of SDA, what we have done in this year, more or less without much impact on the overall revenue of SDA, we should end the year coming financial year. So what we are telling that we will be at a flattish sale in FY23 versus FY23. Exactly, yes. Got it, got it. And, and are we prepared for that pent-up demand? Are we keeping that much of inventory uh, available with us to cater the pent-up demand. We don't have excess capacity at our end. Right? So we still continue to produce the SDA and we are piling up on the inventory for that because we understand that when the demand comes back, this will come from multiple customers at the same time. So unless and until we have that inventory, we will not be able to cater those demands. So we have now yeah. indications from customers to begin certain supplies happening from August. But still, you know, because of this uncertainty of the semiconductor issue, uh, we are projecting that probably Q2 should also remain weak. But it, the things may change if the semiconductor availability changes accordingly. Got it. Got it. Uh, from, from the new product pipeline, we just uh, highlighted so many of them. Uh, can you give us uh, the timeline for commercial production for all these products which we plan? And what is the anticipated apex in each of these products? Uh, the project we, uh, we are talking about is the frame rate product, then monoblime, then uh, our uh, so PASC. Yeah, so see. Uh, the upcoming products, uh, the flame retardants, we are just starting commercial production. So this is a new range of products which we are about to introduce. And we will uh, start the production from mid-June. So we are expecting certain equipments to be installed at the plant, which we expect to happen in 
and we can start the commercial trials at plain, uh, plant scale commercial trials beginning. In terms of uh, the high purity uh, substances for the electronic and semiconductor applications, we expect two years to be a commercialization period to begin. Here we will not have to invest anything major way because we already have an infrastructure. So these products will be produced in using the electrodialysis technology. So we have an enough capacity to take care of this uh, problem. Except we have to invest in uh, in uh, what do you call is improving the air quality at the plant. So controlling controlling uh, conditions at the plant has to be installed, but this is not going to be a big expense in any case. In terms of uh, continuous flow chemistry, monoplime is what we expect to go first in terms of commercialization from next year on continuous flow chemistry. Uh, the solvent for the EV battery is we are almost through with the development part of it. Uh, we will get into pilot scale approvals from the customers probably within September or October of this year. And this is happening. So any continuous flow application from pilots. Uh, in terms of intermediates, we have one intermediate which is now already going into full scale production demand from the customer. And again, potential to double that demand over the next financial year. So that is already happening. The second product which we were waiting for an approval, now the formal approval is in place and we begin commercialization of that product from this year. Then the two new products which uh, we, we, two already existing products which we are doing on continuous flow chemistry. Still we are at the mid stage of development in terms of catalyst development. So I would say it's two and a half months from today. And the very important product which now we are ready with the process and about to submit the samples. Here we expect commercialization to begin in the next 18 months time. Got it, got it. So, so what is the capex for all this project over? Because if I hear it all, it is in next 24 months all this product will be commercial. At least a large part of it will get commercialized. We are doing a capex of 150 crore in the unit 3 of the heat. I think that this does not include all that, right? So what is the additional capacity? So all, these, all these chemistries would require one is your conventional facility, which we are already enhancing the capability. So that will take care of that. And the another thing we require is in terms of continuous flow chemistry. So this would uh, this would require an investment of about 75 crores over the next two years, two years of time. Got it, got it. So basically, additionally, we will require 74 crore, 75 crore, and we should be through with most of the product commercial launches, right? Right, because major part of the expenditure is already being covered during this current expansion. So as and when you have the equipment design ready, and those are the only missing points that you need to install. Otherwise, the rest of the infrastructure, including distillation columns or the reactor plants, everything will be in place by November of this year. Got it. And, and that means if we are launching so many products simultaneously, we will need to plan for a new product sooner than earlier anticipated, right? Earlier we were talking of three to three and a half years for this plan to fully utilize. With so many product launches, are we planning to uh, know, develop the unit uh, for land earlier than what we anticipated uh, uh, earlier? That is what logically we will have. We will be compelled to do that. Probably over next 24 months is when we should start doing that capex. Maybe 18 to 24 months. Got it. Got it. And, and last question before I get back into the uh, Can you explain the opportunity in the flame retardant? Uh, how big that could be? And uh, what is the visibility? And what is the capacity we are starting with now? Uh, in the mid-June, and what is the kind of opportunity we are looking? Because we are calling this out as a separate segment. That means uh, we are thinking that this can become an independently very big uh, segment in its own. So what is the anticipation in the flame retardant side? Flame retardant is a huge market potential, so it runs into a few billions of dollars. But we are specifically targeting very niche segments having applications as 
high purity flame retardants getting into more into the electronics area and also into certain uh, specialized uh, electrical applications. So this area, uh, we, with our existing uh, capacities, we can probably hit up to a revenue, uh, a large revenue, and this is very scalable. So this segment can itself become as good as a Patrath Income's revenue as of today. So this is the product category which can actually, you know, lead into large growth prospects. And also with niche applications, so there are flame retardants in the category which can uh, be sold at a regular quality with, at a uh, reduced price, whereas you have the same product going into a niche application area which can fetch your premium. So this is the area where we are trying to focus in uh, position our products. So what is the current capacity we are starting with in flame retardant right now? And is it the same process as PTC? And existing plants can be used no, for the flame no, retardant? The existing plant and the upcoming expansion can be used for making this flame retardant. Uh, currently, with our existing capacity, before the expansion is completed, technically you can produce about 80 to 100 metric tons a month. And with the expansion uh, coming up online from December of this year, then we can increase this capacity to about 4,000 metric tons to 5,000 metric tons per year. So roughly about 400 to 450 metric tons a month. Got it, got it. And again oh, here... Excuse me, this is the operator. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. I will get back into you. I will get sure, back. Sure, sure. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star, then one. The next question is from Jason Sones from Ashika Stockbroking. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my question. So, uh, so I just wanted to know, I mean, you had alluded before that, you know, Q2 is, has been your best quarter, you know, in terms of an optimum utilization of the plant, and you will require more CapEx to, you know, bring in more revenues. So just wanted to know how was the uh, CapEx were just slated for November, December, uh, you know, just an update on the CapEx as, you know, is it uh, on track? Sorry, I yeah. didn't get your question. Can you please repeat that? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so I was telling you that uh, basically you had mentioned that Q2 was your best quarter in this year, you know, and uh, you had mentioned that there is uh, there is very limited scope for, you know, outbeating that revenue with, uh, in Q2. That's because of uh, capacity constraints. So just wanted to know, you know, this CAPEX, which you have planning 1.5 billion, uh, which is at the age, what is the update on that? And uh, uh, when is it slated to go on stream? So this CAPEX is running on time, on schedule. Uh, probably not more than seven days of delay is what we expect. So still we can cover up that delay. And we expect to have this plant available for production from December of 22, this year. December of 22, okay. And sure, sir. And uh, you, in the previous participants' question, you did mention that now with the heightened geopolitical crisis, you are looking at a flattish, uh, you know, FDA sales for FY23, right? So, uh, yeah. just wanted, uh, just wanted some sense from you because you know FDA has been our main product, you know, uh, main uh, main growth driver. So, uh, looking at you know even beyond, say, you know, FY24. So do you look at growth being very back-ended uh, from that perspective? I mean, uh, you said the underlying demand is very strong. So how do you look at it and how do you look at the whole? We still continue this segment to grow at the most rapid pace. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a small hiccup that is on the way because of this uh, unavailability of the key raw materials for the auto industry. Once this is through, then we again are back into a very high growth uh, situation with, with this particular product segment. Okay, so you do do look at it uh, growing at a rapid pace right, as well. Yes. Sure, sure. So, uh, uh, yeah, that completes the question from my end for right now. I'll join back the queue. And, and again, currently, uh, you know, this SDA applications in auto area is mainly going into the BF6 or the Euro 6 application. So going forward, now we are going to transition into the BF7 area, which will again push up the demand. So this growth rate has to continue in a very robust way. That is what we are expecting, and we are very confident about that as well. Thank you. The next question is from Yash Shah from Investec India. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
Hello, am I audible now? Yes, you are, sir. Yeah. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, sir, my question was regarding a play in the garden, which is going to be a new segment. Uh, can you some uh, throw some light? Uh, what will be the capacity? And when you said that you'll be targeting niche applications. So can you be a bit more specific uh, uh, where and how is this going to be used? Flame retardants are basically added into polymers to give them flame retardant characteristics. So when in the event of fire, it, it holds up the fire and doesn't let it propagate. So that is the basic application of these flame retardants. And we are specifically targeting the area into the electronics application. So for example, just to give you an overview is when you have printed circuit boards. So these also are polymeric uh, substances and these also involve high, high purity grade of uh, flame retardants applications. So this is the area where we are currently focusing on. There are other commercial applications, for example, in your roofing sheets uh, or even in your electric cables. So these are the applications where you don't require a very high purity grade of this flame retardants, but the electronic area is which commands for the high purity application area. So this is the key segment where we are focusing. So primarily we intend to sell this into the uh, East Asia market, you know, where you have a larger consumption of uh, this kind of, larger production of this uh, printed circuit boards kind of stuff. Got it, sir. And sir, what about the capacity, sir? Uh, are we eyeing, have you decided on the capacity? With, with our new plant, we will have a capacity of producing about 5,000 metric tons uh, of this uh, plant data. But of course, this is not going to happen overnight. This product, this segment will also scale up gradually over the next two to two and a half years to reach that kind of level. Right. Um, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned the capacity will be commercialized within 18 months. So that will be by H2O no, no, no. effect. We are going to start commercial, we are starting the commercial plant trials from June, just this June, so two, two months down the line. And immediately after that, we will start commercial production. But when we start from our existing facility, we will be only able to produce about 80 metric tons per month. So nearly about, let us say, starting with a capacity of 900 to 1000 metric tons a year. And when we have the new plant available from December, this capacity automatically ramps up to about 5,000 metric tons per year. Got it, got it, got it. Sir. Uh, so one last question. So, uh, in continuation due to the previous participant question, you said that the SBS growth will be flattish as compared to the previous year. So uh, are you, will we still be in line to achieve about uh, more than upwards of 550 crores of revenue? And if yes, which segment will it be uh, basically coming from? I'm sorry, your voice is not coming very clearly. Can you please repeat it a little slowly? Uh, am I audible now? <coughs> Hello. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So, sir, uh, my only question was that you said that uh, the play, uh, FBA segment will be flatter as, com uh, as compared to FI23, for FI23, right? Uh, all, yeah. all I wanted to ask is, will we still be able to do uh, revenues in FI23 and upwards of 550 crores? Uh, and if yes, which segment will it be basically coming from? Uh, because since SBA is the highest segment, we just wanted to understand that. Right. So we expect the PTC segment to grow uh, at a normal pace. So we have been growing at about 20% in that area. The pharma segment where now the commercializations have begun on a full-scale commercialization. So this is the area where we may expect about 30 to 50 percent of growth. Also, the electrolyte salt segment is where we will see a multiple growth, maybe four to five times of this year's revenue is what we expect. And then we have this addition of uh, flame retardants, which will be a new revenue. So yes, indicatively we can still, uh, despite of flattish SBS, we we uh, expect to grow at a significant rate, even in this financial year. Got it, sir, got it. If I may even one last question, sir. Just wanted to understand, sir, how did we manage to, uh, on quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, how did we manage to increase our gross margin levels of, uh, by approximately 300 basis points in an increasing raw material sizing situation? Sorry, I you... sorry, absolutely could not understand that. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, my my question was about the gross margins. 
uh, if we see quarter on quarter, our gross margin has increased by approximately 300 basis points. So just wanted to understand in an increase in pricing scenario, how have we managed to do that is what my question is. So, see, basically what is happening is we, the customers, uh, we have a very good uh, pricing mechanism with the customers. So, most of the key customers is where we are able to pass on prices quite uh, easily and customers are also happily reciprocating by way of accepting these prices. And recently there is a scenario where we have approached a customer just in this current month of April where certain prices have dropped and we have approached a customer to reduce the prices accordingly. So it's a vice versa mechanism that works very well. So we are able to maintain our margins more or less in the trajectory what we are doing. And of course the overall margins definitely get impacted because the SDAs, since this is the highest uh, margin earned among the, all the four categories. So with reduced SDAs, of course our EBITDA percentages are dropping from quarter two to quarter three to quarter four. But uh, uh, overall we are able to maintain, in the rest of the segments we are able to maintain our pricing and margins comfortably. So I explained, you know, the, if you see on year-on-year -year basis, the increase in uh, revenue, uh, uh, sorry, increase in the shipping cost, increase in the fuel cost, and increase in packaging cost has been quite significant. But this, we have been uh, comfortable in passing on these prices to the customers, and it has worked well so far. All right, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. The next question is from Vishal Biraya from Max Life Insurance. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, congratulations on a good set of numbers. So uh, specifically on the margin side. So my, my question is more uh, on the climb side as to how we were trying to reduce the moisture content in the climb. So where have we reached? And uh, at what stage are we in terms of approvals from some of our clients for supply of this climb? Thank you. Uh, so now in blinds we are undergoing two stages of hydration, dehydration to achieve the required quality. So now we have decided that we go, go with this current ability to bring the product within the required specifications and start approaching customers for approval basis. But our eventual target still remains to achieve this dehydrated product with a single stage of purification which we are working on. We are very close. We are now hitting in the range of about 30 to 35 ppm of moisture, but we need to go down to below 20 ppm. We are not too far, and we are working really hard in this area. But with two stages of dehydration, we are able to meet the customer specifications, and now we are deciding that let us first start uh, you know, getting into commercial approvals with these customers. And simultaneously, in the backdrop, we continue to work uh, to achieve uh, the desired specifications using a single stage of dehydration. Okay, so just to understand this better, with the two stage of dehydration, you are able to meet the 20 uh, ppm uh, requirement, and with yes. Yes. currently you are doing it via two stages. So you need to get that from two stage to one stage. That is the issue. Exactly, because doing it two stage basically reduces my production capacity by 50 percent, or I have to install additional dehydration. <laughs> Either right. So, and also any stage of purification, you typically lose about four to uh, four to five percent of product along with the water that is going out. You also tend to lose about four to five percent of your yields. So, eventually, your final target is to achieve these specifications using a single stage of purification. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and how how big this market will be simple, uh, to uh, this client market, the one that you will be targeting? So the potential customers with whom we are talking right now, the market is really big. I mean, the overall uh, demand for monocline could be anywhere in the range of 15 to 18,000 metric tons. But the customers which we are focusing right now is... Sorry, sorry about the phone call. So that no, customer no. base which we are trying to reach out for this EV, particular EV application, the customers with whom we are in touch, we can easily scale this up to our 3,000 to 4,000 metric tons of a demand. Uh, so 3,000 tons you can supply? 
is what you mean? We can supply. Yeah, we can. Okay. So this will be 3,000 tons of the 18,000 tons market globally. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So you will be basically taking market share, and so the market itself is expanding, no denying. But you would also be taking market share of some of the existing players. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then. Uh, uh, just to get the sense in terms of uh, the rupees crore terms of or million dollars terms of value of this 18,000 tons uh, of market, could you help me with that as well? So basically, it is roughly about the product, depending on the quality area where you are selling, it ranges between five to seven dollars a kg. Oh, okay. Thank you. The next question is from Tanmay M from Mere Asset. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity, sir. So just uh, again a question on uh, SDAs. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, we'll be seeing a flattish uh, number in FY23, uh, but you also mentioned that you have added two customers, uh, uh, the commercial agents, uh, commercial agents for, uh, for one customer will be starting from uh, Q2 and another will be starting from Jan 23. But in spite of that, uh, you are guiding for a flattish uh, SDA growth. Uh, so any reasons apart from the auto slowdown that uh, you are seeing in the legacy portfolio, or uh, if you could just specify that? Basically, we are going to see a quite low demand of SDAs in Q1 and slightly better demand in Q2. But this getting offset and coming to almost the same volume levels in Q3 and Q4 means very strong demand of SDAs in those two quarters, right? And when we say a new customer introduction, typically it takes about a year to two when you, the customer tests you in terms of your performance, consistency in your quality and in your logistic aspects. So this is basically an area where you gradually ramp up your confidence with the customer and that also in, in turn ends up with a ramp up of your volumes going up. So this is the same thing which happened with our three current large customers where you know, we started with probably a very minor uh, volume of their overall demand and now we are commanding nearly more than 50% of their demands. So this is happens over a period of two to three years where the customer confidence builds up and we start to get in more larger volumes. Uh, but again, the, yeah. change of source is also an equally risky proposition, right? Because as I have always explained, you know, the application is so sensitive area. So, uh, and that is the reason why it is such a high entry barrier area. So when the switch or the change or an addition of a new vendor is happening or any kind of a change is happening, that is always done quite cautiously. So the ramp up in terms of volume will happen periodically year-on-year -year basis where you start to get in the larger portion of their business. Sure, but sir, considering, I mean, uh, uh, Q3 and Q4 both being muted, don't you think, I mean, uh, on that base, uh, we can see some growth starting Q2 onwards? Uh, I mean, in spite of that, uh, we are... Uh, we already, for, the, for the first customer, we already have the orders on hand. This uh, was expected to begin supplies from May of this year, and now customer has postponed the delivery to July of this year. This is all leading to, because of the semiconductor uncertainty, which is leading all these uh, you know, delays or postponements that are happening. For our largest customer also, the May schedule has been postponed to end of July schedule. So these kind of movements are currently happening, just purely because that the demand is very strong, but because of the Further, uh, you know, the supply chain is disturbed at the upper end, which is causing, you know, uh, these delays or postponements of the market. Okay. Okay. Because uh, I was just wondering, I mean, if the auto industry will start, you know, recovering, so we should see sort of a pent up demand for uh, our products as well. Okay. So that was the see, reason. Basically, Ukraine is supplying a neon gas. So, Probably almost 70% of the neon gas which is required in the semiconductor production is coming out of Ukraine. So this war which has begun in this uh, January, uh, February area, so this has actually, you know, further 
dampened the availability of semiconductors. Otherwise, we were actually expecting this strong revival happening from this first quarter to happen. But again, we are seeing postponements, and this is purely becoming an output of the geopolitical issues that are currently going on. And uh, uh, if I understand correctly, FY22 at uh, sorry FY23, then we will be seeing a slight uh, shift in the product mix. So any impact on the margins because of this? Uh, we should expect. We expect to maintain margins at the Q4 levels because see, overall the revenue is going to increase and SDA is going to remain stable. So theoretically speaking, we expect the Q4 margin levels over the overall. Sure, sir. Got. It. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Dhruv Muchal from HDFC Asset Management. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to reconfirm, you mentioned Glime market is about 18,000 tons and we are targeting about 3,000 tons. Is that right? Right. And the application, uh, I, I missed it, the application so, uh, is in pharma. Pilot, so once this piloting is done, the first phase we intend to only set up a continuous flow capacity with 3,000 metric tons. And currently, the customers where we are focusing, their demand is higher than that. But we understand that over a period of two to three years, we will be able to, you know, uh, take away almost 50% of their available uh, business. So this is why we are projecting 3,000 megatons. The actual available business with these existing, these potential customers is already much larger. But we understand that complete switch will never happen in this case. So we will just take a part of that business out. Right. And so the application is in pharma or is it in uh, in, in uh, uh, electronics and others? No, so the pharma already we are catering. So pharma application we are already in the range of about 1,000 metric tons a year uh, or slightly higher. But this is, we specifically are targeting the EV segment. Okay. Because uh, sir, if I remember correctly, uh, the current line was to the conventional route that you, I believe, supply to pharma. That is and what we are already doing. That is what we are already doing by the conventional synthesis. And now we will move into the conventional synthesis. Okay. Where the conventional route does not work and uh, hence the, for EV supplies only the conventional route, uh, the, only the continuous route works. Is that fair? No. See, basically the conventional route also works for the EV application, but uh, in production also you have to add one minor purification stage and then you have to go for dual stage of dehydration process to achieve that quality. So then theoretically, you know, your margins get eroded if you try to do all those things uh, and try to sell the product. It is better that we wait for the continuous flow process to actually commercially start supplying the EV application area. And the logical decision why we took that, let us at least get into the queue of, uh, into a queue of approval because that itself is going to take you eight to nine months at least to get a formal approval in place. So for a time being, you can always do a dual stage of dehydration and extra purification to meet the quality. But eventually to make that business really a margin, uh, good margin business, then this will happen only when we go to a continuous flow industry application. Got it. So the two stages that you're currently doing is using the conventional route and getting the product approved and yes. once that because uh, producing by conventional yeah. route itself has a larger raw material uh, usage. So that is one disadvantage and then you have to undergo an additional verification stage at the process point. And also you have to do dual dehydration process. So that is also an additional cost. Then you are left with very low margins to sell the product. But this you can do it for next eight to nine months, but eventually you need to move to a continuous sure, And so what is the application, specific application in EV of this line? So basically this use? goes as a mix. So typically the electrolyte salts, let us say LIPF6. So LIPF6 is a solid, which typically is dissolved into a combination of solvents. So the most prominently used is the dimethyl carbonate. But then with dimethyl carbonate, they, they also add few other solvents. So monoglyme is one of those solvents used as a mixed combination with dimethyl carbonate or other solvents to dissolve the electrolyte salts. So this actually becomes a part of the heart of the Li battery. So this becomes the part of the electrolyte solution within the Li battery. 
Okay. So this market is already supplied by someone, and uh, uh, we are developing an, uh, our own individual independent process to uh, make this and uh, seek uh, and capture this market. Correct. Right. Sure, sir. Uh, so the second thing was uh, uh, the flame retardant uh, product that you mentioned. So is is there any uh, you know interlink between in the existing product that we do, or probably the customers, or uh, uh, for probably the RMs that we have that uh, this this uh, uh, on the flame retardant? Uh, I mean, is there some integration benefit that we are uh, leveraging on? Basically, one of our very large customers of uh, so we are basically supplying a catalyst for epoxidation to a multinational customer, and these people are into manufacturing. So my catalyst is being used to manufacture the raw material for the flame retardant. So the catalyst what we are supplying is actually utilized in manufacturing of the flame retardant raw material. So this is how we became aware of this business and we started talking to the customer. So customer is also wanting a forward integration of what they are making. So this forward integration is what we will do for them. One of their potential customers. So this is how this segment has evolved. So we have been working on this since last three, four years and now uh, the things have materialized. Well. And there's reasonable confidence, at least based on your comments, that uh, the June commercialization will be done. And but, so how is the production approval process? Because again, here it's the uh, electronic application where, I, I mean, I think the semiconductor kind of thing where application, the approval processes are generally very long. So how do you think about the ap approval process? Is it the same auto cycle where it takes about, for five years? This would take about four to five months at least uh, from June to get a formal approval in place. Uh, and this would be a good timing to launch it in June, so that by November, when you have a real plant availability for making these products, by that time you are ready for the uh, with the approvals from the customers. So June logically is the best time for us to launch this product, so that by November, when you have most of the application uh, approvals in place, then you can really run out the production. I mean, I was wondering from the final approval, for example, for HDS, it takes a very long time given the application is very specific. So this, also, basically, uh, just to give you an idea, this product, uh, typically a customer would consume uh, something in few thousand metric tons a year. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so the last three or four customers, each of them would be consuming at least few thousand metric tons of this product. So for getting into a commercial approval process would also require them to buy few loads of this product, few containers of this product running into a couple of hundred metric tons to go, go into final uh, approvals. And this is what we will be able to make from June to November. Okay. Right? So any customer demanding 50 or 80 metric tons for approval process and this is max what we can actually produce from our plan, current plan. So this is the reason why we are you know, going with, not waiting till November, otherwise it will again take you another five or six months to start the program. Sure, sir. Got it, that's very helpful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. The next question is from Archit Joshi from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, a few bits uh, more on the flame retardant side. Uh, I understand that this is a category of some halogenated uh, products and derivatives yes. uh, and largely on the bromination side. Uh, so just wanted to understand uh, our technical expertise, uh, also knowing the fact that there are some very large multinationals who uh, have integration benefits also like Albamal uh, on the bromination okay. side. So how are we looking at uh, this uh, other than what you mentioned earlier uh, that, you know, we are forward integrated from our catalyst only to eventually manufacture flame retardants. Other than that, have we identified certain supply demand gaps? And other than that, if you can also some, throw some light on uh, the technical expertise or the know-how that we have in bromination. Thank you. So there is, see, basically what has happened is a couple of years back, China went into a regulation where in certain cases, uh, usage of flame retardants had been made mandatory. So this has pushed up the demand of flame retardants drastically. And this has caused the severe gap in demand supply. Right? So this is the reason why we find a good opportunity in getting into this. Secondly, uh, there are three large players globally in this area. Lanxess, Albalmal, and uh, ICL. 
now the key position of course will have their own significant benefits in uh, because of their backward integration into the raw materials as well the where we bring in value is to offer a consistent high purity of products where the customers are still struggling to get it so this again we are talking of impurity pro profiles of certain metal elements into this product being into low ppm levels so similar to our uh, sda applications where we are producing substances with very low trace metal impurities the same is the application where we are trying to position ourselves with the flame rate products and that uh, you know within the bromine category this is by volume is one of the largest uh, application areas uh, so anything on the yes. supply supply chain side as to how we are going to procure bromine and so we are working with a couple of large bromine suppliers in india as well as one internationally where we right. intend to have a tie up with them some kind of a tie up in terms of uh, supply agreements consistency and also in uh, you know getting a consistent because bromine itself is in shortage since last few years yeah because exactly yeah supply situation with bromine itself is in a short supply and this is the reason why you need to have a good tie up with uh, a couple of bromine producers and that is what we are currently working on right sir uh, so one last bit uh, i think you mentioned that uh, it's a 3 billion dollar market and out of which we are you know targeting a uh, very niche application within electricals and electronics so uh, just some broad numbers i mean how big would this market be uh, you know specifically pertaining to uh, any numbers on that so again big this market is also again quite large so running into a billion dollar plus uh, market segment and we just need a small pie out actually okay. because this uh, our existing new capex will only entail us to produce somewhere in the range between 4 to 5000 metric tons a year so this typically product cost between 6 to 8 or 9 dollars and this is just the beginning flame retardant what we are so so like in phase transfer capsules how we have a large basket of product flame retardants the commonly used flame retardant is the entry level product and then you have other complicated products other high end chemistries to be involved to further have advanced stage of flame intermediate uh, flame retardants and that is the key area where we will eventually focus thank you the next question is from vishal biraya from max lap insurance please go ahead Yeah. So my question is again on the growth margin side. Is there any of the segments that show that show very sharp improvement in margins or any sharp, imp uh, I mean, uh, decline in raw material costs or anything of that sort, which helped the improve sequential improvement in gross margins? No, no, not not really uh, any major impact. It's just the changing product mix or an independent product that. being sold slightly higher than something else is causing this one or two percent of increase but broadly speaking uh, there is no question of any kind of reduction in price or in uh, uh, relation to cost because everything has increased right but we are fortunate enough that customers are agreeing to accept the increased price and we are able to pass on those prices but more or less speaking there is no change in individual product in terms of price uh, margins Okay, and uh, the freight scenario has it improved uh, over uh, the last uh, few months? Sorry, what scenario? Uh, freight, freight uh, logistics, because we are seeing some no, of no, the no. Uh, the freight scenario has gone from bad to worse actually during the last quarter, and it continues to remain at the worst level. It is good that it is not going from worse to worst. So, okay, okay. it is still at uh, those levels. Uh, Where freight cost is still not coming down. Fortunately, since last couple of weeks, availability of uh, containers has kind of slightly improved. But still, the destination port congestions is a big issue that we are facing. So we have lot of containers in transit, and probably today we have four containers very close to Rotterdam port. since last 30 days but not being delivered on the rotterdam port and customer is also dying out with want of product so that is the actual scenario that is happening in terms of logistics 
So from here, you are able to ship the product probably on time, but then it is not being delivered to the customer on time. That is the key issue right today. Okay. Okay. And uh, so uh, last question is on the raw material side, the TBAB and uh, the other key raw materials that we use. So, and a lot of it is imported. So, do we have some contracts in with these players where they have also not been able to increase the prices with us and we have got the raw material at the, at, at the lower prices and which may have a reset in the coming few quarters? Typically, the way we are working on most of the large products is where we do a quarterly contract and for the raw materials and also revise the pricing with the customers on a quarterly basis. So this works in the best way for even my suppliers and also for my customers. So, you know, and this is the key reason why we are able to sustain these margins for a, such a turbulent year and still we could absorb the increasing price from the suppliers and also pass on the increased price to the customers. So that has worked well for the whole supply chain for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. This is all. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we take the last question from the line of Nilesh G from HDFC. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so my question is on the electrolyte uh, salts. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, these electrolyte salts, you have uh, the chemistry and technology available with you, and uh, you are currently manufacturing those electrolyte salts. Is my understanding correct? Correct, sir. Yeah. And sir, so, um, uh, for particular electrolyte, uh, there is a specific electrode that uh, one can have, right? Or, or is it like that you can have the electrolyte for across lithium base any electrolyte? Is it the one-on-one -on -one combination between electrode and electrolyte or one-to-many relation between electrode and electrolyte? Just a clarification from your side, sir. No, see, basically, Nileshi, we are not into the electrolytes for lithium batteries. We are into electrolytes for the supercapacitor batteries and the energy storage batteries. So typically when you say energy storage batteries, these are uh, again lithium-based batteries or non-lithium-based batteries. So people talk about sodium-based batteries or zinc-based electrolyte batteries. So we are nowhere into the lithium-based uh, side of the battery application. But typically just to answer your question correctly, so people, uh, each company would have its own proprietary combination of electrolyte salts and also its own proprietary mix of solvents or additives that they use to dissolve these salts and make a unique electrolyte formulation. So these are all guarded and patented uh, technologies where each company will have to come up with its own uh, formulation of the electrolyte which has to be different compared to its competitor. So depending on which electrodes you are using, your electrolyte could change. Or keeping the same electrode, again, still your electrolyte could be different from your competitor. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. So you may go ahead. So on, this is Chintan here. Uh, on behalf of the management, I thank you everyone for participating in this earnings call and for your continued support. We have tried to address all your queries. However, if we have missed out on any of your questions, please feel free to reach out to Mr. Ashok Bosha, our CFO, or our IR advisor, ENY, and we will connect with you offline. Thank you and have a great evening.